Hi everyone and welcome. Today we are going to have a look at the boot process. Booting the Linux kernel on embedded systems is a process that consists of the following four stages. The ROM, the secondary program loader, the tertiary program loader, and finally the kernel. The ROM contains code that is executed right after reset or power on. This software is shipped with the chip. It is often proprietary and cannot be replaced. The main purpose of this step is initializing the devices for the next step. The ROM loads code from specific locations into SRAM as DRAM cannot be used yet. The RAM requires code to initialize the memory controller, which cannot be done by ROM. As the SRAM is usually too small to contain the boot loader, an intermediate loader has to be used, the secondary program loader, which may be either open source or proprietary. SPL is a small binary that fits in SRAM and loads the regular boot loader, such as U-Boot or Bearbox, into the RAM. At the end of this step, the SPL is present into the SRAM and the ROM points at the beginning of this code. SPL configures the memory controller and other components so that the tertiary program loader can be loaded into the RAM. If SPL comes with file system drivers, it can read files, such as U-Boot image, from the disk. SPL usually does not allow for any user interaction. At the end of this stage, DRAM contains TPL and SPL can jump to it. Full boot loaders such as U-Boot and Bearbox are finally running. Users can access a command line interface to select a newer kernel, perform maintenance tasks, etc. At the end of this step, the kernel is stored into memory ready to be started. Embedded bootloaders usually disappear once the kernel is loaded in order to free up memory. Many ARM and Intel platforms run firmware based on the Universal Extensible Firmware Interface UEFI. UEFI booting process consists of similar steps to those already discussed. UEFI booting process can also be divided into four steps. Let's have a look at the boot process when the UEFI is used. Step 1. UEFI initializes the hardware. Step 2. The firmware works as the SPL, as I initialize the memory controller and other components, so that an EFI boot manager can be loaded from the EFI system partition or from the network via PXE boot. ESP must be FAT1632 and the boot manager must be located somewhere like this location over here. Is going to be similar on your machine. Step 3. TPL has to load the Linux kernel and an optional RAM disk into memory. As UFI compatible bootloader, one of the many available options can be chosen. Systemd boot, Pairbox, and so on. Systemd boot. 
simple UFI book loader which is included in system D which is installed by default on ARC and it can only start EFI executables. Bearbox Available for many platforms including x86, ARM and MIPS and it's highly specialized in booting the Linux kernel Bearbox can be built to support UFI. And now we are loading the kernel. The bootloader is going to pass some information to the kernel. Let's have a look at some example of this information. Detected hardware such as CPU clock speed and amount of memory. Machine number for those platforms that do not support device trees. We are going to cover device trees very soon. Kernel command line parameters. Size and location of device tree, otherwise the system will have to discover platform details around time, or they have to be encoded in the kernel. Size and location of init RAMs, which is optional, which is a set of directories normally found on root file systems, compressed into an archive. Then these directories are going to be mounted as a slash in the root, by the kernel to run slash init, which is useful to kernel modules, and some other things actually. Now, before device trees, which technology were used? Now, ARM systems did not use device trees, but instead they would store information inside uh, tags whose address was saved into the R2 register to be passed to the kernel. Machine type was also passed to the kernel as an integer stored into R1 register. PowerPCU will simply pass to the kernel a pointer containing the address of an information structure. Device trees Device trees, as defined in the open boot standard, are three data structures with nodes that describe physical devices. Can be either loaded by the bootloader that pass them to the kernel, usually through R2 register, or embedded into the kernel. Device trees are saved into .dts files while they are compiled using the device tree compilers to produce a device tree blob. And this is an example of device tree that is going to describe a MEDAP board. So we have just one CPU and over here and also here we have this compatible property that is very important because the system is going to use it in order to find the right driver for the device. And here we can see the device name strategy like we have device name plus add plus address. Again the compatibility. Now let's have a look at this reg property. All addressable devices get the reg property, which is a list of tuples representing address ranges. Right? As you can see. Now, address is a 32-bit integer called cell, while length can be either a list of cells or it can be empty. Devices with 64-bit addressing will need two cells for each field. So we have four cells over here and here just one. Just have a look at this address cell, side cell. So we have a two and two 
right? While here we have one zero, so we have just the address, but we don't have length, right? So we have just one. The following properties are also important. Interrupt controller. This node receives interrupt signals. Interrupts. Node containing a list of interrupt specifiers. Interrupt parent. Link or fandle that points to the interrupt controller for the current node. Interrupt cells. How many cells are in interrupt specifiers for this interrupt controller? And now you can pause it if you, if you need. We are going to have a look at this example. We can come back. Now this defines Fandle in C to the controller and we have the controller down here. This is saying that this is an interrupt controller. This defines how to specify interrupts, so it's saying that we need two group of digits and in fact over here this serial is defined an interrupt using two group of digits. So here we are defining interrupts for this device. Let's have one more look at the previous table. And let's go back. And you can pause it if you wish. Um, I'm going to move next. Device trees have to be passed to the kernel in their binary representation as a DTB files obtained using the compiler DTC. Bear in mind that DTC does not return verbose debug information. Therefore, working with these files is difficult. The device tree compiler DTC can also be used to unpack device tree block files DTB. Device trees only describe the hardware present on the platform and how this works. They do not say anything about which configuration should be used. Device trees are platform independent, therefore can be considered as a stable. Device trees might make the kernel bigger and might slow the boot process down. Developers should not create extremely detailed device files as these might make the binding process more complex and less flexible when changes occur. These files can always be extended but should never be modified. And that will be all for today. I hope you've enjoyed my class.